Thank you for tuning in, and welcome back to the Sandwich of Coherency. So, let's just go ahead and jump right into this. If you may have noticed, we've reached 800 subscribers, so I would love to thank all of you for tuning in and listening and catching up with us on each of these episodes. And just know, once we reach the thousand subscriber mark we will be doing a giveaway we'll be giving away uh looks like we'll probably do um since it's spring and summer coming up maybe do a hoodie and a couple t-shirts um winner will get to choose which designs they want so you know make sure you like share and subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't um miss an episode and But go ahead and comment in the comment section of, you know, the episodes and we'll pick from those in the section. We'll, we'll pick from the winners there. We'll pick the winner from there. So yeah. But, uh, I wanted to go ahead and start this off by, you know, catching up with things. Um, as you know, the mask mandates have been dropped. Um, just Florida did that. And the White House responded, as expected, of course. And they said that they wouldn't file an appeal, you know, have the DOJ file an appeal until the CDC made their response. And they would follow what the CDC's guidelines said. And remember, they put that bill into place before they gave the CDC the authority which the judge took away because it was unconstitutional. But upon this happening, the CDC went along with what the judge ruled. Now, that being the case, you would think the White House would follow accordingly, since that's what they said they would do. But no, it looks like they're filing an appeal because it looks like the CDC didn't do what they said. And, I, you know, we got to look at this in many ways. As far as the mask mandates go and whatnot, the science is there. The CDC would have broken it out. They would have presented you with all the science, and they would have gone against what the judge ruled. So we have to look at this in many, many different ways. It's however you want to take it. Is it science or was it politics? And that's where we find ourselves at currently. But that's just the start of things. I want to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and get into a, I'm going to catch up with Sky News and go with a little bit of Rita's checklist. It's always interesting to catch up with that. They tend to be along the same lines as us, so it's, you know, nice to check in every now and then. But in itself, it is kind of interesting that Australian media tends to be more in line with observing what American politics are and presenting it in better, in, in a more transparent fashion than American media does. The irony, the irony. But let's just go ahead and jump right into this. Introduce now a segment called Lefties Losing It. And joining me to uh, discuss Lefties Losing It is Director of Communications at the Institute of Public Affairs, Evan Mulholland. Evan, I want to uh, devote some of tonight's segment to one of the most unhinged media personalities in the US, the chronically wrong Joy Reid from MSNBC, who had this tantrum about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis how to do fascism for fun and profit. If you are Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, you start out by making it illegal for schools to make white children feel discomfort while being taught about our nation's history of racial discrimination and violence. I'm going to pause it right there. I mean, that's... I mean, when you think when you listen to what she said, it's absolutely cringeworthy. And and I mean that wholeheartedly. I mean, no child should be made to feel guilty or terrible for the sins of those that came before them. Oh, I mean, look, you can teach the history, but teaching the history 
should not include telling some five-year-old child, some six-year-old, that they are racist, that they are evil, that they are white supremacists, that they are the reason that black people suffer and can't get ahead. You should not be telling these things to five-year-olds, to young children, innocent children. It takes a really sick person to have that kind of mindset. And by her own logic, I guess all Native Americans should be made to feel bad about slavery in the United States. Yes, they should be part of that conversation as well, because we've, you know, I've talked about this before, but if for those of you that didn't catch those ep that episode or whatnot, um... The Trail of Tears, you hear a lot about the Trail of Tears, how the Native Americans were kicked off their land and made to wander in the wild. But the part they don't tell you about that was, as they called them, the five civilized tribes. Well, those tribes were very prominent slave owners back in the day. They owned a lot of slaves. And when the Civil War ended and whatnot, Mind you, the Native Americans did not want to give up their slaves. They actually supported the South, especially. They were very prominent in Virginia, especially. And when the war ended, they did not want to give up their, tier, their, their slaves. And so they were booted off the land after they lost, not wanting to give up their slaves. And then they wandered on a trail of tears, crying because they did not want to give up their slaves. And there you go. So I guess by Joy Reid's logic, Native Americans should also be made to feel guilty about it because they had a hand in it. And I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to, make children suffer for the sins of those that came before them, then yes, they should fall right in line with that. I mean, that's just my opinion on that. That's just my opinion. But no, I, I, I can't see how anybody would think that we should do that to children of any sorts. That's just evil. But... Let's continue. Just unhinged, untruthful. Uh, why are these people so determined to be outraged about things that don't exist? I mean, there's plenty of stuff you can rail against that actually exists in 2022. But as we know and as we've discussed here, that Florida bill does not ban the word gay. It does not ban... Uh, it just says, you know, kindergartners shouldn't be taught about radical gender theory. I would have thought that was pretty sound. Pretty straightforward, and this proves what happens when uh, conservatives actually play offense. Uh, Ron DeSantis has been hitting six rather than blocking every ball, as, as conservatives usually do, like sometimes here in Australia on cultural issues. Uh, but this also has to do with the fact that Joy Reid's ratings have dropped by about one or two million. She's stuck on one million. Tucker Carlson's on about four million. So I guess calling him out, calling DeSantis out, is all to do with ratings, all to try to get mainstream Americans to actually watch her show. Well, yes, and let's listen to Joy again. This time uh, she is railing against Tucker Carlson, calling him essentially a fascist because he did a segment on testosterone. She's losing it. And it's a message that resonates deeply with Tucker's Gen X to elderly white male evangelical audience. The formerly bow-tied Dancing with the Stars contestants' hypermasculinity flex is some pretty blatant fascist posturing. The decline of real men is code for conservative white men who need laser beams to make white babies. I'm going to stop it right there. You know, you might not like how Tucker delivered it or the banter he gives along with it. The comedic sense that he adds to it or whatnot, but the... Turns out testosterone issues in Western culture are actually a big deal. I think they've said they've dropped some 23% or something. I mean, this is now might not depends on how people want to take it. Uh, you know, we'll save all that for a different, different conversation, but I will say that there's like, you know, 
that saying from before really does ring true. And these days it's become more and more relevant in the fact that weak men create hard times. And we are in a moment of hard times. And they're just beginning. They're just beginning. I know that people in this modern age are all up in arms and tiffed about the idea of masculinity and things as such. And sure, maybe things aren't perfect, but um, I don't see the issues of masculinity and femininity. It, it, let them be. You, you know what I mean? Like, if you don't want to be them, I guess... Pretend to be something else. You do you. But you shouldn't, I don't know, I guess you shouldn't be allowed to make, try and make other people or force other people to go along with it for it to ring true for yourself. And since they can't get adults to do it, they have positioned it towards the children. I guess you were wondering how I was going to segue into the next bit, but there you go. And recently, you know, um, some parents were at a school board meeting and they were bringing to light things that we've talked about many times about teachers telling things to students that they shouldn't be telling to students and trying to hide it from the parents. And that's a big problem, you know. And I think we should all be able to agree with the fact that no adult should be telling a child to keep secrets from their parents about what that adult has told them. Especially when those things deal with anything that involves sex or anything in that wheelhouse. No adult should be telling a child to keep secrets from their parents. If it's something that you can't say to the parents, then you should not be telling it to their child. But let's just go ahead and give a quick listen to this. I'm here to bring awareness to the emails that had surfaced earlier this month. The one I find most disturbing of all is of a third grade teacher trying to talk about sex with eight-year-old students. These are eight-year-old children that she's trying to hold a sexual orientation class with. A parent shared their concern and their um, objection to it and pulled their kid out. And instead of this teacher being concerned of what she did wrong, she goes to a district employee and asks for ways of how she can continue to teach sexual orientation to her third grade class. You guys want us to believe that this isn't a propaganda, that no agenda is being held? This wasn't just any sexuality class. This was specifically designed three days a week. She taught LGBTQ curriculum in her class. It raises the question, how many of those students are excelling in that classroom? Is everybody in that class getting A's in math, English, grammar, social studies? That we can dedicate three days a week to teach eight-year-olds about sexual orientation? I don't care what kind of sex is being discussed. The word sexuality, nudity, does not belong in the ears in a classroom of uh, eight-year-old kids. And when a parent showed their concern, what does this teacher do? Completely disregards and goes behind the parent's back trying to find ways of how to continue these lesson plans. The level of disrespect that has been shown to Christian conservative parents is becoming very obvious. It's like all of a sudden, just because we don't fit the agenda, we don't fit in, within the parameters of the agenda that's being pushed, we're being disregarded and pushed to the side. And I, I, you know, you have to agree wholeheartedly with what this woman had to say. Whether you believe the Christian conservative part, it, it, that's fine. You don't have to be Christian or conservative. 
But if you're a parent and you care about your child, this should concern you. The simple fact that this is not the only case of this. You know, we've gone over many different school districts and states that are doing this. And when you think about the fact that education is down, okay, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I just see this trend of as wokeness seems to have invaded the education system, education in the education system has begun to decline. I mean, that's just my careful observation. And, and, but you have areas like Baltimore, Los Angeles, you have areas around the United States where children are failing in larger numbers. African American children, the highest of all of them. They have the highest illiteracy rates, the highest lack of math, the highest lack of ability to read, or knowledge of history. And it's gotten worse, as I said, as I've noticed, as a wokeness has found its way into the schools. They've gone away from teaching history. History has to have some kind of ideology behind it. You know, same thing with math now. You saw what happened with Florida. They had to ban books that were supposed to be math books for the students that somehow had woke agenda nonsense in them. And people are not understanding this is, they are, the mindset that they're giving these children is not going to be conducive for them to have long productive lives and be happy. So many of these people who say that they're fighting on behalf of this and that, they're not happy. They're not happy. And please, for all the liberals out there, we love you. All the, we love you, Democrats, you know. But please, please, please. Stop speaking for other people. Stop. You don't know what you're talking about. And you don't represent them all. And I gotta say this, this is really important. One black person doesn't represent all of the African American people in the United States. Well, all. I mean, the 41.99, let's just say 42 million of them. I won't go back into the abortion rant again, um, but I will say that in a nation of 350 some odd million people, African American people, make up only 42 million. And guess what? It's been like that for a long time. Every other ethnicity in the United States has continued to grow and grow and grow, whilst the African American community has stagnated. Actually, the numbers have gone down. And as I pointed out before, even New York has higher abortion rates than birth rates of African Americans. But like I said, that's for another talk. And I'm not going to get too far into that tonight because I'm starting to go on a tangent. It all connects, but we're going to keep this at the education level and simply say that the reality is, is that no, teachers should not be talking to students about this. And for those that say, well, what if the children ask or anything like that? Then it's your job to say that that is not a conversation for the classroom. That is something that must be done between you and your parents. That is a conversation for you and your parents. As your math teacher, it is, I 
should not and I will not be talking about sex or sexuality or anything like that. If you want to have those conversations, have them with your parent. If you want to have them with me and your parent, yeah, the teacher, you can say that. You can offer to be present with the parents to help explain or talk to them, but you alone should not be having those conversations with other people's children and then telling them, don't tell your parents. No, 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 no. That sketch is hell and you know it. But we will see how this plays out as more and more parents come out and demand rights and demand to know what their children are being taught in school. We'll see how that changes things. Will the government and school boards bug back? Think about it. When the school boards and the government tell parents, you have no rights to your children, you have no rights to know what we are teaching them, you will find parents begin to pull them out of school more and more. And you will find the Democrats attempting to bring back a policy they tried before. The Republicans were part of that as well, but to ban homeschooling. Or if you're going to homeschool, you have to teach what would be taught in the classroom anyway. So we'll see if they bring that back. But I thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.